If I'd ask you today what your favorite book of the Bible is, what would you say? Well, some of you say, what, John? Or you might say Revelation, or you might say Matthew, or whatever. But I've never heard anybody say that my favorite book of the Bible is 1 Peter. Never in my ministry have ever had that, you know. And why is that? Because Peter deals with a lot of difficult stuff. He talks about suffering and tribulation and problems and all of that. And I want you to know, all of us have some problems, don't we? We've got some problems and difficulties, and, and uh, we go through uh, a lot of difficult trials in our life, and we know that is, and, 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 as, and even in America as Christians, you know, we're going through some difficult times. You know, we're thinking about the rising rate of inflation. I think it's at 8% right now. We know that we go to the grocery store and we go, oh my goodness, that was like, it's a dollar more than it was last time I was in here. We go to the gas pumps and we at least it come down a couple of pennies. And they've got a deal going on today at $4.19 here. I got to stop on the way out and get some gas. I never would have thought of it and say, what a deal at four nineteen, you know. And then we've got all these things that are happening, you know, in our life and in our world and political unrest. And people are now protesting the Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, overturn of that decision by the Supreme Court. And, you know, and uh, a lot of people hate the president and other people waiting for a new president and and other people trying to still trying to uh, find a way to to, to put uh, president trump in jail and so we can go on and on we've got a lot of issues and uh, we got health issues uh we we're not immune to it no matter what our age is you know i and uh this week uh, i used a pretty healthy person but I woke up the other day and I'm like, man, my back is killing me. What, what did I do? And I didn't remember hurting my back, you know. And so this whole week I've been like really gingerly walking around. And said, Lord, please let this be something that I won't you know, keep me from being able to be here on Saturday and Sunday. But I hope today as we look at First Peter that uh, as he talks about suffering and persecution, he not only talks about suffering and persecution, he talks about faithfulness. He talks about holiness. He talks about what it means to belong to the God's people and how to live in a fallen world. And that's why being part of a church family is so critical to our walk in this world today. You know, because the church isn't an hour on Sunday, is it? The church is the called out ones, the ecclesia, the people of God. So you're the church, and you really seek to be the church more than just showing up here in worship. You seek to be the church as you go out into the world, into your families, your workplaces, your schools. And you bring the love of Jesus to those that you are around. So Peter writes so that believers will experience the full benefit of your relationship with God. You know, I don't know about you, but I like the full benefits. And, and that's why I have to really be careful of staying away from smorgasbords. You know, I, I, I just, Golden Corral, no, I'm not going to go there. I mean, they've got desserts like running all out, out all over the place, you know, and I, I am a weak person when it comes to desserts. I walked by a cooler donut out there three times and I said, no, I will not. I will not. I will not. You know, so, you know, that's the full benefit of being part of this church family. You can have donuts, you know. So we think about the full benefits of being a believer, of being part of the family of God. And, you know, and he wants, uh, he wants us to see that no matter what happens in our life, no matter what we're going through, whether it's sickness or financial failures or struggles or troubles, whatever we're going through or the world of political unrest or inflation, that God still is in control. And I want you to know that ultimately when the end comes, no matter what you've gone through, we'll be vindicated and we'll be glorified. So today, as I share with you, I want to focus this message on God, that God wants you to live courageously. You know, I don't know if you saw the movie Courageous uh, several years ago when it came out with a wonderful movie that was put together. But it takes courage. It takes courage to live your life. It takes courage to face your problems. It takes courage, you know, to live for God, especially in a culture that is increasingly non-Christian. Now, I'm not going to give you the statistics. You can look them up, but they're saying they just took a poll and the people that attend church and profess Jesus Christ as Savior has even slipped down even lower than it was five years ago. So we're living in a very unchristian culture in America today. And in fact, uh, some of the other places around the world and other countries are thinking about sending missionaries to us. Think about that. And uh, so, uh, but, so it takes courage to live your life as a believer. And let's look at our scripture today. And it's out of 1 Peter, and I'm going to read uh, these nine verses from 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 12. You can turn in your Bible. I'm going to use the New Living Translation today, or you can see it on the screen or in your notes. 
All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. and We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him, and even though you have never seen him, though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their message was not for themselves but for you, and now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. You know, what a wonderful passage of scripture. And as I was reading that again this morning, I'm going, wow. You know, God has prepared for us some wonderful, wonderful things in our lives and in our future and because of our relationship with God. And I want you to know that if you look at this passage today, and as we apply these truths to our lives, I want you to know that you'll experience boldness in your life. You'll experience boldness in your life. You'll have strength in your daily walk. And as challenges come your way, I want you to know that with the power of God, you'll not only be able to exist, but to experience God's power over the difficulties that you're facing. Now, I don't know what your difficulties are, and I guess if we started yelling them out, we'd go, oh, my goodness. You know, we've got some really difficulties here. And, and, and it could be simple difficulties. It may be just, you know, trying to deal with a, a bad situation at work. It might be a, a neighbor that you don't get along with. Your difficulty might be a health issue. Your difficulty might be trying to balance your checkbook and trying to figure out how am I going to pay all the bills. You know, that, that could be part of that. But we have a lot of difficulties that we face, relationship problems. And uh, I'd, I'd love to share with you about how you can heal relationships. But, you know, Peter begins this letter by talking about those challenges, you know, and those problems that we faced. And, and, and my first point is that we're reminded that as believers, we have an unfair advantage in facing trials. We have an unfair advantage in facing trials. In other words, if you've been born again, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the ability to approach your problems with a whole different way. You know, there is privileges with knowing Jesus. There's privileges with being born again. And we're going to look at three of those privileges. There are three advantages. There are three benefits. There are three privileges of being born again. First of all, we have a life filled with wonderful expectations. A life filled with wonderful expectations. Look at verse 3. All honor to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is by his boundless mercy that God has given us the privilege of being born again. Now we live with this wonderful expectation. So because of our faith, because of being born again, because of being you know, forgiven of all of our sins and given the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ, we have the hope of knowing that one day there will be more. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, my favorite part of the, uh, of the meal is dessert. It really is. I, I love it when, you know, when uh, my, my wife will say, okay, save your fork. You know, I always say, oh, man, there's something more coming. It's even better. That it is with our salvation. You know, our salvation is for this world as we're saved from our sin and we're able to give them the power of the Holy Spirit within us to live a life for Jesus Christ. But we also have a hope of a glorious expectation in heaven. And uh, I, I love singing those old hymns that talk about heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. That's one of the old hymns that I used to sing growing up. You know, and so why do we have this wonderful expectation? Because Jesus Christ 
rose from the dead. He rose again from the dead. Why? That's a great expectation. You know, because he rose from the dead, you also will have a resurrected life. You'll have a resurrected body. He became the first fruits of all those that slept. Now, you as a believer, and, and in the Baptist church, we believe in baptism by immersion, fully immersion. You know, not that little dab of do you, not a sprinkle here, but we believe by going all the way under. And what do we usually say? Your pastor, I'm not exactly what he says. I've, not really, I've never seen him baptized. But we usually say, buried with Christ in baptism, rising to walk in newness of life. That's what I've always said. So buried with Christ, in other words, we're being dying to the old life. The sins have been forgiven as Jesus was put into the grave. And then as he come, came out of the grave on Easter Sunday that we, pro, you know, the third day, the resurrection Sunday, then we also experience that resurrected life. New life. All of our sins are forgiven. Cast into the depths of the sea. You know, remembered no more as far as the east is from the west. And, that, and that's exciting, you know. So if Jesus Christ has power over death, and he's given us that power in our life. He can conquer the greatest of enemies in your life. You know, Paul wrote in Romans 8, 11, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. So when you accept Christ as your Savior, when Jesus Christ comes into your life, the very moment you say, yes, Jesus, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ comes and lives in your life. And that's what it means to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not like a second thing is going to happen down the road. No, the Holy Spirit comes in your life the very moment that you receive Christ. And so you have the power of Jesus. He lives in you. And just as he was raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal body by the same spirit living within you. Now we've talked about Easter. And that proves that Jesus Christ has the power over death and he has the power over your life. And because we live with this wonderful expectation. And this expectation is not based on worldly events. I know some of you that are still working, or you have your investments in the stock market. Anybody here got investments in the stock market? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid, okay? The rest of you just put it in the mattress, okay? And Okay, the ashtray of your car. That may be your investment. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I know that as a retired guy, and I'm, I'm, I'm not only to look forward to the once a month Social Security check, I look forward to getting a little bit of benefit from the investments that I've made. And I don't know if you've followed any of the news lately, but the Dow Jones average has not been all that good this year. In fact, if you invested in a lot of things, a lot of things that you invest in, go, where'd it go? Where'd it go, you know? And, and why did it go away? And we have all these reasons why they tell us it went away and they're gonna come back and all those things, but, but it's, not, it's not based on, your expectation is not based on your finances. It's not based upon the outcome of a presidential election. It's based on the assurance that Jesus Christ is Lord over power, over sin and death. A wonderful expectation. Now there's another word for expectation. You know what that is? It's hope, hope. Yeah, and, that, and that's a wonderful thought that we have in our life today is that we have a hope in Jesus Christ. And another word for that is optimism. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty optimistic person. But I know a lot of people that are the opposite of that. They're pessimists. Now, how many of you are optimists here? Go ahead, raise your hand. All right, how many of you are pessimists? Be honest with me, okay? And not quite as many pessimists, or less the rest of you are just not really willing to raise your hand. Um, that's okay. I'm not, I, I'm not taking notes. I didn't take a snapshot here uh, of, uh, of who that was, but, uh, you know, we we're built that way. You know, a lot of us see, you know, glasses that are half full and, you know, and, and, and others see it half empty. We, that's the way that we live our life. And, and, but we have a hope of knowing that, that we have optimism and we have the permission to be optimistic. We have the permission, according to the word of God, to be optimistic, to believe that God is in control and there is a better day coming. Now, we go through trials, whether it's back pain or surgeries like Pastor Eric is having to go through. We have, you know, a, a hope of realizing that God is in control and he has a reason for our suffering. He, he has permitted suffering in our life. He's, he's, he's permitted these feeble bodies that we live in to break down. You know, we, that's just part of life. We get cancer. We get heart disease. We have all these issues. 
like me, I got shingles about eight years ago, and that messed me up pretty good. And I uh, had nerve damage as a result of that. I'd, I found out when I was 33 that I had glaucoma, so I've been fighting that battle with my eyes all my life. You know, so we, we have all of these things, but we can't let that get us down. I didn't go all of a sudden, okay, I found out I've got glaucoma, so I'm just going to quit the ministry. No, I found out that I've got a problem with this. No, I'm going to stop. No, I have optimism to know that God is in control and that God is still going to use me. And I want you to know that God will still use you no matter where you've been and what, you've, what you're going through. You know, we must be people of hope. Melvin J. Evans said, The men who build the future are those who know that greater things are yet to come. Their minds are illumined by the blazing sun of hope. I, I like knowing that. We can live the assurance that the best is yet to come. Regardless of how tomorrow looks, the best is yet to come. Peter talks of our inheritance, our priceless inheritance. Let's look back in our text today in verses 4 and 5. Kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Well, I like that idea of knowing that there's, there's treasures waiting for me in heaven that are beyond the reach of decay. Everything in around us is falling apart in it. Think about it. Uh, we have to maintain our church. You know, we have to make sure our houses are painted. We have to make sure that, you know, that we take care of all the things that are constantly breaking down or all of a sudden our pump stops working. We have no water to shower with. You know, we've got things that break down. And we, we have that. It's constantly decaying, rusting and corrupting and, and all of these things that are happening. But we have a promise that is pure and undefiled and is waiting for us in heaven. And I want you to know it's a blessed hope. He doesn't say a lot about the inheritance. Doesn't say a lot about it. He doesn't describe it in detail because it can't be described. All I know is that uh, what God has provided in heaven is going to be a wonderful experience. You know, and uh, you can just forget about the streets of gold and the gates of jasper and all those things. I mean, that's going to be cool enough, but uh, forget, forget about there'll be no more pain or sorrow or suffering or darkness or any of those things as the book of Revelation talks about. But just think about it. It'll be walking face to face with Jesus, knowing him and, and knowing his presence in our life you know, in a, re, a real way for all of eternity. Now look at verse 10. This salvation was something the prophets wanted to know more about. Even the prophets who were prophesying about what was to come with Jesus Christ, that, you know, they, they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you, even though they had many questions as to what it all could mean. In other words, they were prophesying, we're going, we're going well, God gave me this message, but I'm not quite sure about what it all is going to mean. You know, but verse 12 goes on to say that these things into which the angels long to look. Even the angels are going, wow, there's a great expectation for you. There's a great hope for you. There's a great comfort in knowing that there is more to come. And it's a wonderful expectation. Our inheritance is more than the fact that we'll just live for all of eternity. Our inheritance is more than just a quantity of time. It's measured by a quality of experience beyond our ability to even imagine. You know, Paul said, and we know these verses pretty well, in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, No eye hath seen, nor ear hath heard, nor no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, how many of you ever heard the song, I Can Only Imagine? <laughs> you had to be living in a hole somewhere if you haven't heard that song, okay? Because... Um, that came out like 30 years ago. I had the privilege of going out to a conference at Saddleback Church in California, and, and uh, Mercy Me was in concert there. And that just became a hit about that time. And then I didn't, didn't realize it. And then, and then as it, over the last few years, as I've done funeral services, they've not been asking for How Great Thou Art, although that has been the number one popular funeral song. They've been asking for I Can Only Imagine. You know, that's become a wonderful song because it testifies of this scripture we can't even imagine think of the greatest beauty that you could ever think about think the most beautiful scening think about the most wonderful table spread for you think about everything you could even imagine of beauty and you know and and then and then multiply that a zillion times and you still can't even imagine what god has prepared for those who love him i'm excited about that you know, we have a wonderful expectation for the future. And then Peter says, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though it is necessary for to endure many trials for a while. Now, why did he have to ruin it and talk about trials? 
I mean, we we're talking about all the wonderful things that he's got prepared for us. He said, now, wait a minute. In the meantime, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through heartache. You're going to go through discouragement. You're going to go through despair. You're going to go through financial failure. You're going to go through COVID. Oh, my goodness. COVID. I hate that word. Oh, they got a new strain out. Oh, my goodness. You know, every time we turn around, they're sending something more from China. I don't know. Um, but Peter is trying to explain that our problems are not without meaning. Our problems are not without meaning. As I mentioned before, 1 Peter is a book about hard times. He talks a lot about suffering. And then later in the book, if you read through the book of 1 Peter, he talks specifically about dealing with oppression and persecution. But that's not the only way that we suffer in life. Some believers around the world suffer tremendous persecution because of their faith. In fact, there is more persecution going on in the world today than it ever has been in all of history because people's faith in Jesus Christ. I have a friend that uh, is, is retired from ministry, but he's still preaching through the internet. And he's preaching to, to many, many crowds in nations like India and other places and, and with the screens that are presented out. And, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people giving their life to Jesus and realizing that the hope that they're hearing to the gospel that we have to present is something that they've never heard before and they want Jesus Christ into their life. Now, they, you know, we get excited if one or two people give their life to Christ, you know, but think about, uh, you know, what, what it means to, for people around the world who have nothing. They're saying, I'm going to give my life to Christ, even though it may mean that I'm excommunicated from my family, even though it might mean that I'm beaten for my, my cause. Anybody here on the way in get stopped by a police and saying, you can't go to church? Anybody here who came today, uh, received a phone call, said, you better not be there or we're going to arrest you. No, they're not. We have, you know, even in the midst of an unchristian nation that we were coming, we still have the freedom to worship and we worship God any way that we choose. So a text today, Peter refer refers to the many trials we have to endure. Now, a lot of times we as believers in America think that a trial is that someone, you know, makes fun of us because we're Christian. You know, we think that, wow, I, I, as I told the group last night, I said, you know, when I was uh, starting a church in Delray Beach uh, many years ago, uh, the first church I served out of seminary, and I only, I've only served two churches in my, in my ministry, and uh, I would go out and knock on doors on Saturday. That's how you did it back then. You know, you went and knocked on doors. There weren't as many gated communities. And I want you to know, people weren't always kind when I knocked on doors. I tried to wait till like 10 o'clock on Saturday, and I'd go over to like 10 to 12 or 1 o'clock and knock on doors and invite people to church and, and try to ask them questions like, if you die today, would you go to heaven? Are you sure about your salvation? Would you know? And sometimes people were just really, really mean. I mean, they'd slam the door. They'd sick the dogs on me, you know? But I want you to know that I was not being persecuted. That's not persecution. You know, we think about that's persecution. But, you know, not only we have persecution, but he's dealing, we're dealing with health problems and job problems. And all believers have to deal with this. It's part of life. But here's what I want you to notice. Every problem that you go through is not without meaning. Every problem that you go through, God can work it to the goal of good. That's what Romans 8.28 is all about. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Does that mean that everything that is happening in your life is good? No. It's horrible. A lot of things that you're going through is horrible. You know, going through COVID and shutting down our churches is horrible. You know, uh, my, both of my sons, you know, ended up in the hospital for 10 and 12 days each. You know, with, with, uh, we, we wouldn't even go into it. I, I talked to a man last night who was in the hospital for months because of COVID. So we deal with lots of problems. But I want you to know that our problems serve us in a special way. Our problems serve us. Our problems have a point. That's why in verse 7 it says, These trials are only to test your faith, to show that it's strong and pure. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, and your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. Now, we've all been tested. We all know what it's about to be tested for our faith. Heard a story that Gary Carr told many years ago. It's about Chippy the parakeet. 
Anybody own a, a bird here? Okay, a couple, a couple of people own a bird. And, uh, you know, parakeets are, are, are pretty noisy and pretty chirpy and, and pretty messy. Well, the chippy never saw it coming, and one second he was peacefully perched on his cage, you know, he was setting a song in the air, and next second he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. And his problem began when his owner decided to clean his cage. And he decided to clean his cage with a vacuum. And so what happened is that he, as she was cleaning the cage, she got a phone call, and she reached over to grab the phone and she moved the vacuum and all of a sudden you hear this sound going <laughs> and she realized she'd sucked old Chippy right into the vacuum cleaner. So she quickly, with frantically, she turned off the vacuum and she opened up the, the vacuum bag and she pulled out Chippy and he was all filled with all kinds of junk and dirt and you know scum and, and so she said, well I gotta do something about this. So she ran into the bathroom and she quickly turned on the bathtub cold water and she doused him and washed him off really 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 good and then she realized that old chippy was probably pretty cold and dazed all that so she said well i gotta do something about that and she did like any good pet owner would do she got the blow dryer out and she blew dry him and she made him uh you know uh try to warm him up a little bit well did chippy survive yes but he doesn't sing much anymore <laughs> He kind of just sits and he kind of stares a lot. It's not hard to see why. He was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. And it's enough to steal the song from any stout heart. We need to understand as Christians, the way that we face our storms serve as a testimony of God's goodness of our faith. No matter how much that you're sucked in and that you're washed up and you're blown over, I want you to know that God still is in control. We are told that in God's word, we're to think it not strange when trials come upon us. In other words, we're to understand that God has not deserted us just because we're going through various kinds of trials. I hear people all the time, well, God doesn't love us. If, how could a loving God let this happen to us? How, how could I get in this accident? Or how could I lose my job? Or whatever, if God loved me, and if I was, you know, if, if truly, folks, I don't know about you, but if you read your Bible, if you really read your Bible, it isn't about if you just believe in Jesus, everything is going to be wonderful. Now, there's some preachers on TV, and I won't give their names, but they've got some of the largest churches in our nation. And they'll stand up, and they'll never talk about sin. They'll never talk about repentance. They'll talk about how much God is going to bless you. Now, I believe with all my heart, he will bless you. But he's not going to, protect, he's not going to keep you from going through storms and heartaches and problems and discouragements and situations. And as Christians, though, we have an unfair advantage. That unfair advantage is that we have... Jesus Christ in our life, the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, and I want you to know that all these teachings help us to understand that we should face the storms of life with faith and strength. And we see this dramatically presented in our text today. Dr. Richard Meir tells a story about a little boy. He went to the lake and he got this little sailboat from his, from his parents and he was so excited about this sailboat. And so he put that sailboat out in the lake and, you know, he would watch it and it would it'd sail on down and, and uh, all of a sudden this wind came up and started blowing that sailboat way out in the middle of the lake. And, you know, and the little boy started crying because he never think he'd ever see his sailboat again. And so another boy, an older boy came by and, and he saw the little boy crying and says, why are you crying? And he says, well, my sailboat's out there in the lake and I'm, I can't get to it anymore. So the big boy, he picks up some stones and he starts throwing rocks. He threw rocks, and he threw rocks, and he threw rocks, and, and, and the little boy says, why are you throwing rocks at my sailboat? And the, and, and the big boy said to him, he said, listen, son, I'm not throwing at your sailboat. I'm throwing it on the other side of your sailboat to create ripples in the water where the boat will come back to you. See, God allows the storms in our life sometimes because, you know, we have ripples in our life, but it allows God to bring us back. It allows his power to happen in our life. God knows what he's doing when he allows the, the, you know, the, the stones to be thrown toward us. Because they're meant to draw us closer to him. Let me ask you a question. When have you prayed the hardest? Was it when everything was going well? Or was it when you're having difficulties? 
when you have a teenager that's wayward, when you have a child that's sick, and when you have a, a parent that's dying, when you have a job that's lost, when you have a financial failure, is that when you pray the most? I don't know about you. I do. You know, those storms, those problems happen for a reason. Let's look at our text once more. These trials are only to test your faith. Now, who is this test for? Is it for God? He's going, well, hey, I just think this is a cool day. I'm going to test you today. I, I'm going to put you through the test and see what, how it happened. No, it's not for God. God knows what you're going to do. He knows your heart. He knows your ability. He knows what you're going to do. Those tests are for you. Those are for you. To help you understand where you need to grow in your walk with God. You know, look at that. Look at, he says in verse 7. So if your faith remains strong after being tried by fiery trials... It will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So when you're tested and the power of God is evident in your life, it brings glory to God. It brings glory to God. Now this phrase took me by surprise. It will bring you much praise and glory and honor. Is Peter saying that you'll receive praise on that final day? That's exactly what he's saying. He said that you'll receive praise. You know, I want you to realize that God is proud of you when you go through a storm. And then you allow God's power to, to work in your life. You trust him through the midst of that storm. I, I still, one of my favorite passages of scripture, I don't have time to, to deal with it all today. But I just love it when the disciples were in the boat, you know, and Jesus was there down on the bottom sleeping. You know, don't you love that passage? They said, well, Master, don't you care we're perishing? And Jesus gets up and he, he, he kind of wipes the sleep from his eyes. He goes, okay, peace be still. And all of a sudden, the storms stop. The wind stops blowing. And he basically then looks at his disciples and says, why is it that you have little faith? You see, in our lives, we're going to have storms. We're going to have problems. We're going to have surgeries. We're going to have back pain. We're going to have glaucoma. We're going to have heart disease. We're going to have all of these issues. We're going to have financial failure. We're going to have a stock market that is decreasing. We're going to have all these things. But in the midst of it, we stay strong through the power of the Spirit of God in our life. We'll hear Jesus tell us, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You know, if anybody knows what Jesus was talking about it was Peter. Now, Peter gets a lot of bad rap, doesn't he? Who, you know, we, we, first thing goes to our mind. Yeah, he's, he's the dude that denied Jesus three times. Now, what else did he do, though? He stood beside Jesus over and over again. He'd been corrected. He'd been restored. He'd been praised by Jesus. And then when he preached, as we read in the book of Acts, 3,000 men were saved in their families. Every time you go through the fire, every time you pass through the test, Jesus is on the other side waiting to say to you, well done, good job. So there's a point to our problems. They teach us, they help us. Quickly, the third advantage to being born again, we can look forward to God's protection every step of the way. We can look forward to God's protection every step of the way. And God in his mighty power will protect you until you receive this salvation because you are trusting in him you see he's not talking about the salvation that you receive knowing christ as savior you've already received that he's talking about your ultimate salvation the day when you see jesus face to face when we're forever changed into the likeness into his likeness we begin the journey of spending eternity in his presence as pastors we have the responsibility many times to go to the bedside of our members who are passing away and just a week ago one of our members that had been very special to me was at the hospice house here in Wustoff uh, hospice house on uh, Arvitas house and uh, I went in and walked in and I he opened his eyes for me and, and I prayed with him and I asked God God just whatever days you give him be good days the Lord if you want to release him into your presence let it happen a day later, he did go into the presence of Jesus. You see, but the thing is, he's not suffering. He's experiencing the abundant and eternal life that God has prepared for him. 
See, verse 5 says, God in his mighty power will protect you. In the Greek, the word protect is the military term. It's a connotation not that God just helps you endure the problems as much as that God helps you to defeat your problems. So you're not in the battle by yourself. God is in the battle with you. Think about the trial that you're going through. It doesn't take you long to figure it out, does it? You know what trial you're going through. Whether it's, it's a marriage problem, whether it's a situation with your children or your parents, whether it's your ministry, whether it's your business. Some are big problems and some are little problems. Unfortunately, in a lot of churches that I've been in, there's a lot of people who make big problems out of little problems. And the greatest thing that this church could ever have and always retain is love for God and love for one another. Because that speaks volumes to the world around us. We have assurance, the one who has power over death, that our problems last for only, a little, only last for a little while. We have a wonderful expectation that the future, our future on earth, and our future in eternity is in God's hands. And we live with the assurance that our problems have a point. They serve us. They teach us. They help us perfect our faith. And we live in assurance that in the midst of our problems, God has promised to be there with us every step of the way. So today I want to ask you to give your problems over to God. Let his Holy Spirit deal in your life, if you would. I'm going to ask you today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and you're not certain that you have a relationship with Christ, and that if you would die today that you'd be in heaven, I'd ask you to give your life to Jesus. It's not a big process. It's just saying, Jesus, I believe that you love me, and you you care for me that you died for my sins. You were buried, and on the third day you rose again, and I ask you to come into my life, and I turn from my sins, and I ask you, Lord, to give me you know, eternal life and cleanse me. And when you do that, he comes into your life. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to be right here on the front row, and if any of you during the time in which the praise band is singing would like to come and just pray with me about any situation in your life, you know, I'll pray with you about that, whether receiving Christ, whether a problem about something you're dealing with. I pray that it's time that you listen to what God is doing in your life. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for the hope that you give us in Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that you continue to guide us and direct us every step of the way. I pray for those who need to receive Christ, that they would do so today, whether here in this room or listening online, that they'd say, yes, Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior, to be, give me that eternal life and forgiveness of sin and the power and the assurance to live with a great expectation. And Lord, I pray for those that are dealing with problems today, that Lord, they'd be able to turn those problems over to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.